by the time it started to like hurt to breathe, I'm like, mm, hold on, that's not normal. Uh, we need to go check that out. And it turned out that I had multiple clusters of pulmonary embolisms all over my lungs and two DVTs in my real leg. And I was a walking time bomb. Everybody that encountered me was really surprised that I was still alive because they said that if it had hit, I would not have survived it. I would have died. Welcome to Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast, helping DIY marketers find your micro influencer magic so you attract raving fans and repeat buyers. I'm your host, Candice Rodardi, and this week I'm joined by visibility coach, Sarah Varagis. Sarah approaches both business and life with a unique perspective, believing in the impossible and recognizing that happiness is a state of mind. With her creative mind, she blends her background in graphic design, marketing, photography, branding, and education to offer a multifaceted approach to coaching and mentorship. Also known as she -Rex, Sarah is the host of a weekly podcast and YouTube channel and is the author of The Yellow Brick Road to Self-Discovery, Developing the Mental and Emotional Strength of an Entrepreneur. Her journey has been anything but conventional, but she embraces every version of herself along the way. Welcome. Thank you. So I Thank would like, you. I would love to just acknowledge the fact that you and I met last night. We did. And you did. agreed to be here today because I had a cancellation that I forgot about. So I thought I had an episode for this week and I didn't. <laughs> So thank you for pulling me out of a out of a hard place. I really appreciate it. But I really wanted to, when I met you, I was like, I need to hear your story. So tell us your story. How'd you get to where you are? Um. Oh, dear goodness. There's a long, long road to my story, but I'm going to try to make it super like cliff notes here. Um. So went to school for graphic design, Um. got out, got into the job for a little bit. Something happened, got out of the job, got into teaching. Um, decided that I loved the kids, but I really didn't like the job very much. Um, and I really don't believe you should stay in a job that you're not happy in. That's not fulfilling you. Um, even if you are making a difference where you are, like it, it needs to be a both way. Um, got into photography, um, and was a photographer for about 10 years. Uh, loved it, was really good at it. Um, but I have this thing and I didn't realize this at the time, but like in hindsight, I kind of recreate myself every 10 years. I kind of have this need to keep evolving and be a new version of me. And so circumstances, life, world, pandemic, circumstances, um, got into marketing, had been coaching people in my industries in photography for years, but just over coffee dates. Um, and when the pandemic hit and I lost all my business and decided that maybe I could do this, you know, um, I'm feisty and scrappy and I'm not going to let a pandemic take me down. Um, and so I pivoted hard and fast and created an Instagram class that attracted people and then turned it into coaching. And then it's just evolved into what it is today. Uh, that's the quick, <laughs> that's the quick and dirty story. Tell us the She-Rex story. Tell us how, the, how did that come about? So She-Rex, this is Martha the, uh, Martha the T-Rex. Um, I have a little tiny uh, um, figurine Jurassic Park thing. Um, in 2018, I was a photographer and doing really well. It was going to be my highest, um, my best year. And I was also substitute teaching. Um, I was a weightlifter and had been a weightlifter for years. Um, and I would, I would never call myself a weight, not, not, nothing competitively, just like for exercise. Um, but so I was used to going nonstop, um, used to being in a little bit of soreness and stuff like that. So when I started having this pain in my upper shoulder, uh, I didn't think anything of it. Um, and then the next day it went down my arm didn't think of anything of it. It's like, I must have done something. I worked a wedding the weekend before I worked out, you know, I lift weights. I must have done something. Didn't think anything of it. The third day, by the time it started to like hurt to breathe, I'm like, mm, hold on, that's not normal. Uh, we need to go check that out. And it turned out that I had multiple clusters of pulmonary embolisms all over my lungs and two DVTs in my real leg. 
and I was a walking time bomb. Everybody that encountered me was really surprised that I was still alive because they said that if it had hit, I would not have survived it. I would have died instantly. Um, On the recovery side of it, I was not allowed to do anything. I was not allowed to work out. I was not allowed to, if I went and worked a wedding, I had to bring other people with me just in case I got too tired. I was told to slow down and I'm like, slow down. I run a business. I have been doing this. The reason I had such a busy year was because I've been pushing for this. Um, And so slowing down was just a new concept that I wasn't used to. And I realized in the slowing down process that I wasn't actually having a lot of fun with my life. I was on the go all the time and I was being, and, and I had defined my life around the success I was having, but I wasn't actually having fun anymore. And as a creative person at heart, I need that balance in my life. And so I was watching this movie Uh, It's called Mr. Right. Anna Kendrick is the lead in it. Her character's name is Martha. And she wants, she's a paleontologist and identifies with the uh, T-Rex. And it's a very quirky, quirky movie. Um, Basically, she falls in love with a a assassin hitman that has a conscious. Um, It's very weird, weird humor. You either like it or you don't. Um, But I loved it. Um, And at one point she was like, I'm a T-Rex, I'm invincible. And in that moment, I thought, well, I survived a massive stroke that nobody thought I should have. I'm invincible. Maybe I'm a T-Rex too. And so then I, the way my brain works, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm a T-Rex. So I went out and got a T-Rex toy and I went back to what does my fun look like? And as a photographer, my fun is taking pictures. So I started taking this little tiny toy T-Rex everywhere I went and taking pictures of her um, in coffee shops, at the zoo, um, like at the museum. And then I would narrate that story in on my Instagram based on what I thought she was thinking. So we went to the zoo and I took pictures of her next to the alligator exhibit and she's like she hasn't seen her cousin in such a long time she's so happy to see them again or by the merry-go-round and and like take a picture of the merry-go-round going around and martha wants to know why is there not a t-rex on this merry-go-round it is not well diversified here or went to donut store and there's a donut store in town called the duck donuts and she's like martha wants to know why is the duck in charge of the donuts and like always very uh snarky (laughs) in her thinking and her process but it was me playing again and martha's sassy oh she's totally (laughs) sassy she's so sassy she doesn't understand why more of the world isn't about her because everyone loves her don't they like why don't they um and she became a thing and that was during photography and my i had a client at one point that was just as quirky as i was and i asked her like Hey, do you mind if I do something a little bit different? And I brought Martha with me to the wedding and I posed her next to their cake that had dinosaurs on top of it and did little stories at the end of the night. And then I asked her, I was like, do you want to pose with her? She's like, yes, absolutely. And then it became a thing. And then all of a sudden my bride started wanting her to come to their weddings. And I started having random people ask, are you bringing Martha to our session too? And because I was documenting it everywhere. And after a while, she became the representation, the visual uh, motif of my business. And the question was like, well, Martha's coming to my event too, right? Martha's coming to my birthday party. Oh, is Martha coming to like, are you going to photograph? Am I one of your clients too? Was the question that was being asked. Like, am I cool enough to have Martha in my images too and get tagged in it? And so when the pandemic hit and I lost all the photography business and I am like scrambling to start something new and I'm like, okay, I'll do a a marketing company. I'll coach people how to do this. And trying to think of a name, I automatically went, well, I want them to feel like everywhere they go, everyone knows who they are, just like a T-Rex. 
And I had a lot of people telling me I shouldn't do it. It's going to push some people away. They're not going to like it. And I was like, yeah, but if there's one thing that I've learned over this process, the more you show up as you, the more people are attracted to you that get you. And then it just allows you to have fun. It allows you to really be more of you and just have fun. And at this point in my life, I'm all about fun and flow. So if it goes with the flow and it's a lot of fun to do, that's kind of my vibe. Um, and I leave dinosaurs everywhere I go now just because it's. You you told me this last night uh, that you have little tiny dinosaurs that you just leave <laughs> wherever have, you go. I have tiny sauruses now. I found them on Amazon um, and I I gift them to people and I I um, leave them places and I leave them high enough up that you know that a kid didn't leave it behind. And I leave them high enough up that adults will find them. And like, so if I went to the library, like I'll leave it in a book section and I'll put it up high enough and just tuck it back a little bit. So like you accidentally find it. Oh, my favorite thing. So I like to leave them in coffee shops and I like to leave them high up. And this one coffee shop that I frequent um, found theirs and gave it a job. And put it next to the register, holding on to like all their post-it notes. And of course, like when they walk away, I take a little snapshot of it. I'm like, look, guys, they gave it a job. Because I take pictures of wherever I leave them and put yeah. it on my Instagram. Um, so that my audience knows that tiny sauruses are being left everywhere I go. I hope that the audience is paying attention to what you're doing. <laughs> I really do. It, it, don't steal the dinosaur idea. Come up with your own. But this is so brilliant. I In my brain, a gazillion years ago, when I lived in Texas, we had um, a, a, like a video thing that we did. It was called Handmade in Texas. And I would go around and I'd take little videos of people and I, you know, I, I and little in, little interviews on the fly while we were walking around like to, to craft shows and stuff. And I wanted to reboot that when we moved to Michigan, but I couldn't figure out how to make that work here. And then pandemic. But in my brain right now, I'm thinking because mastodons are really popular in the town that I live in because they've found mastodon. Um, they've ex excavated mastodons in the local area. And so mastodons are a pretty big deal. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, how can I find a mastodon and mm -hmm. little mini mastodons and steal Sarah's idea? How can I yeah. steal? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you, know, you, go, to, go, you ahead. go to Etsy, you know, or you go to a local like wood shop and you like, hey, would you know how to make a mastodon? Oh, there's a, there's a local place down here that has a 3d printer that i'm sure could print one for oh me. yeah <laughs> you know? yeah absolutely I, this is not this is not hard the, the thing is do i want to do it right yeah. do i want to do it but what i love about this and a lot of people struggle with instagram because they they don't know what to post or whatnot but, but what i love is that you know exactly what you're going to do you have a plan i do everywhere yeah. you go you leave a little dinosaur you take a picture of it and you tell a story yeah. And the thing is, is I've had so many people like, are you leaving like she wrecks marketing, like penciled on the bottom of it? Are you leaving with a business card? And I'm like, I'm like, no, I'm not. And they're like, but people could find you that way. I'm like, that's not the point. That's not the point. The point is that I'm re I'm, I'm reintroducing my, my brand and my brand is playful and fun and go with the flow to the audience that I already have on a regular basis, who was following me. So it's in my stories. And so that, you know, anywhere you're going, you know, and then if I, if I'll say like, oh, I was here today, I'm leaving this here. Who is anybody in the area? Like, do you think you can go and find it if you do take a picture of it? And when, so when I go speaking, I, my last networking event that I spoke at, I hid two tiny sources in the room and I said, if anybody can find it, and then they all started, I was like, not right now. Not now, not now. If if you can find it, um, I'm gifting one of my books to you. Wow. Um, and so, you know, we had, we had two people find it and come up and they're like, oh, I, I got it. I, I found it, but they loved it too. And, and they're like, do we, do we get to keep the tiny source? I'm like, of course you get to keep the tiny source. I've got oh, plenty funny. of them. I don't need them back. Okay. So what, what is the, the Instagram channel that you're doing that on? Um, it's she underscore Rex underscore marketing. So she Rex like T-Rex. She Rex marketing. 
and then you just post pictures randomly from where you are with little yeah. I love it. So true story. And I don't yeah. think that I've ever posted them. I think that they're just between my husband and I. <laughs> but I should find them. Don't be surprised if they aren't on Instagram by the time uh this episode comes out. So yeah. so my husband and I were taking a walk around a local park and we found a dinosaur toy on the ground. Is it was a T Rex. I'm pretty sure it was a T Rex. And so we just got silly and we took funny pictures with the T-Rex <laughs> and we sent them to our daughter. But, you know, people do stuff like that when they find random, yeah. you know, yeah. I actually, that, you know, now that I think about it, another time we were at a park, I found a dinosaur on a table and did the same thing, took pictures with the dinosaur. <laughs> but I our, mean, da- our daughter's a paleontologist, playful, right? So, yeah. Oh, oh our yeah, daughter's yeah, a paleontologist. Yeah. So dinosaurs are a thing. And it's uh-huh. so funny because we thought that she wanted to be a paleontologist for the dinosaurs. But that's not it. She's doing tiny little mammal. She's oh. researching tiny little mammals. But she um, <laughs> works in a, a repository for dinosaur bones. And so mm-hmm. in right, you know, in the area where she's working are uh, Triceratops and probably T-Rexes mm-hmm. and all these, you know, these bones that are just waiting to be cataloged. And so every day she's walking among dinosaurs. And it's like the four-year-old daughter, our four-year-old daughter, 20 years later. Yeah, she's walking in the in the steps where that you know she imagined herself. It's just she's more into the little tiny things. She spends yeah. her days looking in through a tel- through a telescope, uh, not a telescope, a microscope at at trays of rocks, little tiny rocks, yeah. and finding yeah. the, the things that aren't rocks and pulling them out. She's into it. She likes it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the most important thing, right? As long as you love what you're doing, then yeah, that's yeah. what you do. Well, this is what she's wanted to do since she was four. So yeah, right. You know, uh, so di- so we we react to dinosaurs because it's they've been part of our life for twenty yes. years. Yes. So. Well, and I mean, you know, my parents fly to Florida every year. They're snowboard snowbirds, and um, my mom found a T Rex on the beach that was left and took a picture of it and sent it to me. And she's like, "Look." A T Rex, and I'm like, see, I already attract them into my life, and now the I, the attraction is so strong in my life that I'm attracting them into your life too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I think T Rexes can be found everywhere because they like to wander off and go for adventures, mm-hmm. and they're solo. They they're okay yeah. on their own. Yeah, yeah, but they have a good time. Little tiny arms. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, little tiny tiny arms, but no excuses. They still get a lot done. Exactly. Well, the arms are unnecessary. I read somewhere that if they had, if they hadn't have died out from, however, the, what was it, a um, asteroid, uh, that they probably would have lost their arms altogether. That they would have evolved yeah. to have no arms at all. Hmm. Which I wonder what that would have looked like. Hmm. You know. Yeah. Isn't that interesting. I just, that it's, interesting. I just, it's <sighs> anthropology and not, not anthropology. Paleontology is fascinating. It's fascinating because, you know, animals over time get really big and then they get small again and then they get big again. And it's just, you know, they adapt over thousands and thousands of years. It doesn't happen overnight um, to do really cool things. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've got me where I take dinosaurs and I make up brand new stories about them that are probably never possible, but it entertains me. So, you know, and anybody who's along for the ride, I'm like, come join my tribe. It's a T-Rex a, tribe. A story doesn't have to be real. Mm-mm. Stories can be made up. That's the whole point of it being a story. Mm-hmm. So um, let's talk about the impossible. Okay. So what, but what, okay. You have this approach that in the impossible is possible. So talk, talk to me about that. I think I've just been through so many different things in my life that felt like they were impossible to overcome. And yet I have overcome them. That. I just don't think impossible is a concept that I have any, any desire to be like, I don't buy into it. I just don't buy into it. Um, I've always been a risk taker. Um, I just, I'm the one that if someone tells me it's not possible, I'm like, but is it though? Is that true? Have you tried it? Have you tried it from a lot of different angles? What if we try it from this angle instead? And I want to play the what if game and I want to jump into it. And and I mean, obviously, if it serves a purpose for me to go after it, I just don't believe that other people's limited belief should be mine as well. Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's dig into your book. Tell me about oh, your book. Okay. Yeah. 
the yellow brick road because i was it started when I martha's was, on the cover oh yeah well she's in the book too she she's it. one of the narrators <laughs> um her sass her sassiness um like even on the back cover i have little graphics of me and martha um because i don't i don't like i don't like to do normal it's boring normal is boring for me so anything that's a little bit different so the back cover is my name is sarah v and this is martha t and together we make she Rex marketing um and martha says get it i'm a girl t-rex so it's she Rex. ha it's hilarious isn't it and I said, as you can see, we do business a little differently around here. And she says, yeah, we're highly creative professionals. And we teach you how to embrace your inner T-Rex so you can take over the world. You know, so it's very like back and forth. But she is, she's the sassy version of me. I'm more polite and professional. Um, but there is still that sassiness in me that likes to question everything. And that's her voice. Um, so the book came about when I was... I don't know. My mind goes a mile a minute all the time. And I realized at one point that the Wizard of Oz, Dorothy's journey is a journey to self-discovery. Because along the way, like in the beginning, she didn't know who she was. She just wanted to run away from everything because it wasn't going her way. And then she landed in this new place that felt like nothing was ever going to go her way. And as she grew as a person, she became more confident. Um and I thought that's the one thing that as entrepreneurs, we've always really struggled with is that up and down and who are you? And and if you don't really know who you are in the beginning of your journey, it can either completely take down your business in the process, or if you learn to become more self-aware and you learn from other people around you and you embrace like a business squad, basically, you know, like the, what she has and you learn to overcome all of the obstacles in your way because the entrepreneurship journey, the solopreneurship journey is really about learning who you are and learning how to, how to face all of the emotional and mental wars that are going to happen along the way. Because the business side of your business, yes, you're always growing in the craft of your business, but really the people who either die or thrive are the ones who are strong enough to overcome the valleys that you're going to hit because you don't think that's your stopping point, right? If, if you don't allow yourself the option that that's your stopping point, and you know how to fight through it, those are the ones who will get stronger. So each chapter of the book goes through a different portion of her journey. And I parallel it because um, I love analogies. Um, so like you're Kansas. What do you do if people at home and people in your life don't really agree with the fact that you're going into a business instead of having a traditional corporate job? What do you do with them? That's whole, the whole first chapter. The second one is like somewhere over the rainbow. Okay, let's dig into what exactly is the process of visualization. Um, defining your why is the cyclones chapter. You're going to have lots of cyclones, but unless you know what your why is, you're going to get swept away all the time. Your why is your foundation. That's where you're going to go back to all the time. That's what's going to ground you. Mm -hmm. The power of self-talk. Is the difference between the Wicked Witch of the West and Glinda the Good Witch. We all have two voices in our head. We're really used to hearing the negative voice all the time, but the Good Witch is there too. So I refer to those two as your best coach voice versus your biggest bully voice. And the biggest bully is only speaking out of fear and it's trying to keep you small and the best coach of voice just wants the best for you. And if you're willing to look for the best coach of voice, it's always there. And over the years, I've trained myself how to listen to that best coach and how to talk back to the biggest bully. And so that chapter goes through the exercise of like, how do you do that though? Um, squad goals, identifying your distractions. That's the poppy fields. 
You can think that the Wicked Witch of the West was the one that cast the spell on her to go to sleep and fall into the poppy field. But what kind of things are you using as your procrastination and your distractions that are keeping you from doing the things that you know you need to do? Are you like mine used to be education? Mm -hmm. I would use education as my primary distraction. I'm like, no, I got to learn this new thing first. Before I take the next step, I can't take the next step. You it just, I, you just identified the distraction of most entrepreneurs. Yes. If they're trying, they want to learn yes. how to do something before they do it. Yes. And that doesn't work. And that doesn't work. That doesn't work. It, it's the, what is it? The paralysis by analysis where you have to feel, you feel, feel like you have to have every single thing worked out before you do it. And that's not how that works. It's messy action all the way. Um, and then and it's surrounding yourself by other people that can help, you know, build you up. They're either on your level or slightly above your level that are going to get you there. Um, but I do, I take, I have like 10 chapters and I take each part of her journey. I can keep going if you want me to. <laughs> sure. I, this is a good analogy. I mean, actually, the, all, all of this is stuff that the entrepreneur needs to know. So yeah. yeah, finish up. Yeah. Seeking the wizard is find when to find a coach. The flying monkeys. Remember after she seeks the wizard and he sends her then on the journey to go get something. Um, the flying monkeys is thought work. So your thoughts will fly away with you if you do not know how to control them. And in that chapter, I talk about the, do you know, um, I'm sure you do the circumstance, thoughts, feelings, actions, and results. Um, there's a whole process that you can go through to recognize how your mind works and then dig, how to dig, dig into that. A lot of people will have a thought about something and they'll think the thought is fact when actually the thought is just your like, is it your thought or is it a circumstance? The example I have in the book is the thought is I failed the test. Um, I, I failed the test to move on to the next level. And, or that's the circumstance. Sorry. The, the circumstance is I failed the test to move on to my next level. And the thought is, well, that was a waste of time. And the feeling is I feel like a failure action. I'm not going to do that again. And then the result is I got passed over the, for the promotion but you can change that. Yeah. I, that isn't the way my mind would have thought about it at all. I would have been like, okay, damn it. What did I do wrong? How can I make it better? And what did I learn from it? Right. <laughs> but like, that's, but that's the thing is like the circumstances are just the facts. Yeah. There's no opinion around them. It just, it is, or it isn't. The thoughts are how you interpret the circumstance, but a lot of people take their thoughts as truth. Mm -hmm. And that's not how it is. Or their fears as true. Or their right, their fears. Yeah. And their fears are their feelings then. Because their feelings are then the judgments they make about their thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then the actions are the actions you take based on your feelings and your emotions. And then your results are direct directly from your actions that you take. So if you mm -hmm. want to change, so we call it the, the C line, T line, F line, A line, R line. So if you want to change your R line, if your if your result isn't something that you like right now, do a diagram of the C T F A R and dig into your brain and ask, okay, what was the actual circumstance that happened here? And what was my thought when it happened? And what how did that thought made me make me feel? What action did I take? Oh, so that's how I got to that result. Okay. I want a different result. Okay. So then you start with the C line and you put the circumstance in there and then you write all your things down, but then you jump down to the R line and you write in, what do you want your result to be? And then you backstep it and then you take it back up. Okay. If that's what my result needs to be. What does my action have to be to get that result? Okay, then what does my feeling have to look like? Then what does my thought have to look like? And then you look at it, and you you dissect it, and you say, okay, 
if I want that result, then I need to first start with the thought of this, whatever your circumstances. I need to start with this thought and then you have to like own it. So it's a, it's a, a process of self-awareness of, it's also called metacognition where you're evaluating your own thought process. Reverse um, engineering your goal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, um, I'm a, I don't know if you've ever heard of Noah St. John and affirmations. I know affirmations. I don't know Noah St. John. Affirmations with an O and oh. not an I. So an affirmation is kind of like an affirmation. Affirm, you form it in your mind. Affirm, yeah. you you say it's true. Okay. Uh, and the thing is, a lot of folks think that affirmations are lying to yourself. Well, an affirmation is in the form of a question. So you're not lying to yourself. What you're doing is you're asking yourself, how can this happen? Yeah. So, you know, I am a money magnet goes from I'm a money magnet to why am I a money magnet? Mm. Why is money flowing easily in, in, into my life? And then yeah. your brain starts to form the answer. This is a lot like that. Yeah. You start with the result, you question it, and then you start to develop how to get there backwards, mm -hmm. reverse engineering. It's a, it's yeah. an ex, it's a great way to learn a language. It's a great way to learn anything. Yeah. It's yeah, how I, I, it's how I was an A student because I would look at the answers and try to get, work backwards to get the, to figure out if that was the answer to the question. Hmm. Uh, and, See, I don't, and, I, and I didn't yeah. do very well in school um, because I had too many people telling me there was a right and wrong way of doing them. And, and I, of course I was also incredibly shy in school. I didn't talk at all. Um, and at, by the time I was graduating, I realized how much I missed out on because I was too afraid of everybody and what they might think of me and that I decided to start changing that. So I took baby steps starting in my freshman year of college and just started challenging myself and pushing myself out of my little comfort zone until I got to the place where I transferred colleges and nobody believed that I was shy. Everyone thought I was very assertive and I'm like, not not really though <laughs> but you changed I, your narrative by working backwards i did i did yeah. i decided what i wanted my results and i found tactics and strategies to get there and a ways of not overwhelming myself though which is kind of what i do for my clients you know i i find time ways to like break it into really easy steps to get to the results that they want i love this and if you're listening to the show and you want to see a graphic of the a uh, coaching model that Sarah's sharing. Uh, there will be a graphic in the show notes. Awesome. So, because right. it it is a uh, it's a visual thing. You just you yeah. just put out a lot of of letters, and sometimes you need to see. Absolutely. So, oh, speaking absolutely. of C, let's talk about visibility because you are the visibility yeah. coach, and obviously you have a system. So, talk to me about how somebody that's small and doing their own marketing can become more visible. Yeah. So, um. The first thing they need to do is they need to decide like what kind of clients they want to go after. And I know people hate that because they're like, I don't want a niche. I don't want to choose. And I'm like, okay, okay. If you, if you don't know who you want to niche to, at least know what kind of messages you feel are so necessary to talk about all the time. I and think we're, we need to go back to that results model thing there for a minute because people think that if they have a niche, that's the only per people who are going to be purchasing from them. Oh, absolutely not. And yeah. it's, yeah, no, get over no, that no, thought. Not. Okay, yeah. sorry, I interrupted yeah, you. So, so yeah, if we want to go back to that for a minute, um, I, you got to think about the fact that, oh, I have this analogy that I love. Um, And of course, you know, I make everything up. So uh, Goldilocks and the three bears, right? Mama bear, Papa bear, baby bear. You've got three very different personalities in one household. They all like very different things. All their chairs are different. All their porridge is different. All their beds are different. And yet they live in one household. So imagine Goldilocks coming in, trying to like do her market research, figuring out exactly who these people are. So she knows how, like how to reach all of them and realizing that she has to do three different messages to try to get one person or the whole household to listen to her. That doesn't work. That is such a good analogy. That's the best analogy <laughs> I've ever heard about target niching. Wow. So it's just, I mean, this is how my brain works. Um, I'm totally <laughs> stealing that in the future, by the way. Oh yeah, please do. <laughs> please do. Um, but it's the kind of thing that 
you like even in my family, you know, I'm the oldest of four kids and we all have very different tastes in things when you're not going to catch us all with one message. Or if you walk into a high school cafeteria and you start screaming a message out, thinking that it's going to reach everybody, all of your different groups of kids, it's, they're going to look at you and go, well, you're not talking to me. Oh, you're not talking to me. Are you? No, that doesn't resonate with me. And then if you're not getting any of them, then if you're not, the message doesn't talk directly to that one person, then you might get a trickle here or there, but it's not going to flow, right? However, you've always got that one person who has lots of different social groups um, or like back to the analogy of um, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, uh, my YouTube video went over this where I was like, there's one company in the woods, though, that does help everybody, but they do it by marketing only to the mama bears in the woods. Um, and it's the carpenter ants. And they make furniture and they only make the softest chairs and the softest beds. But when they come in to like talk to you, they've got as long as you're there before you leave, they're like, oh, well, what else do you need to help with? And, you know, do you want to sit in the hardest chair to compare to the softest chair so you know you're getting the softest chair, you know, and it's once you get them in, once you are talking to them, that person is usually connected to other people who can then talk about your service and know, I know I'm pretty sure they can help you too, you know, but you've got to talk to the people so that they feel like you're directing it at them and they can feel like oh, she's talking to me. This is about me. Because that's the and at the end of the day, everyone wants to feel like you see them and you hear them and it resonates with them so much that they're like, oh, I bet they can help me. But if it's so white noise, crowded, and it just looks like everything else, they're flipping they're swiping past you, not even thinking about it. Or if you meet, so the other thing, so I don't just work with social media. I work with clients on social media. I find the right networking events that they should be going to. I figure out what podcast they should you know, reach out to. I'm helping them do webinars. I'm helping them uh, find panels to go speak on or what panels to like collaborate with for people. Anything visibility, in-person, online, but it comes down to your visuals, your verbal, so any words, and your vibe. And your vibe is you. I call it the exposure triangle because photography days, you know. But the, ex the exposure triangle is there are the three major things that you need to know in order to reach that maximum exposure level for yourself and your business. And it's all about getting you in front of the right people that are going to feel connected to you. It's called the exposure triangle so that you've got the three things working together. You've got your visuals, which are all about your, um, yes, your online social media, but it's also like, how are you showing up in person? Are you showing up? in clothes that match your vibe, you know, are you showing up and, and, and when you're showing up, like what's your body language? Cause like body language speaks so much louder than, than you think it does. And I can look at someone standing. In fact, I saw a video the other day where I saw this guy standing next to a client that had just bought and, and the client is like owning the space and the person's Instagram that we're looking at He's making himself small. And I was like, oh, dude, you don't understand what your body language is communicating right now. So my clients, I work with them on all levels of visual, not just their online visuals, but like their in-person visuals too. And what is this communicating when you're doing this? Um, and their verbal is, how are they showing up? How are they talking about themselves you know, when you go to a networking event and you ask someone what they do and they just rattle it off and they just say exactly what they do 
and they're they're so in their head talking about what they do and who they service and they're just hoping like anybody they're so desperate for the sale that anybody might get and they're just they're so in their head that they're not watching the people that they're talking to to seeing if the person that they're talking to even understands what they're talking about I've seen it so, so as a visibility coach um I'm a little bit more brazen than most people are so uh when I talk to people and they rattle off what they do I'll ask them, I'm like, okay, and what exactly does that mean? Or what exactly does that look like? Can you give me an example of what that looks like? And they kind of stop. They're like, um, uh, and I said, because can I be honest with you? And they're like, yeah. And it's like, I don't think anybody actually understands what that means. And they're like, uh, and I said, and they'll be stuttered. And they're like, wait, I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm like, how many people after you say what you do, how many people ask you a follow-up question or, or ask you or, or start to tell a story of like, oh yeah, I think my brother does something like that. I think my brother-in-law does something. Yeah. I think, and does it, is it like this? How many people ask you for further explanation or have a relatable story versus go, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I do. And they jump into their thing or you get deer in headlights <laughs> and they're like, uh-huh. Yeah. I said, but are you paying attention to them or are you so caught up in what you've decided? This is what you're going to sound like that you haven't even paid attention to the fact of whether they are understanding you or not. And I've, I've done that to a few people. I'm like, do you, or I'll ask them like, okay, so who is your ideal client? And they're like, well, I can talk, well, I can work with everybody. And I said, well, obviously that's not true. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, I didn't understand anything that you just said because you were using industry terms. So obviously you're not working with someone like me because of the language that you're using and that's your verbal. If you don't have the right language that will speak to anybody, then you're not reaching everybody. But if you have language, like, so if you're going to use your industry terms, then you're reaching people that are either in your industry or adjacent to it and know enough about your terms that they can like make sense of it. And everybody else is going to politely nod their head and then kind of look in both directions to see where else they can go because they don't, because they don't, they either don't want to be rude, but more than that, they don't want to look stupid. They don't want to admit that they have no idea what you're talking about and thus look stupid in the process because the way you're talking, you're assuming that they know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and a little bit of that comes back to what you said at the beginning with people just want to be seen. Yeah. So visibility isn't just about how are you visible? It's how do you make people feel visible? Yes, yes absolutely. So what yeah. is your, how, what part of your message is making someone feel seen or heard or you yeah. know, understood? Yeah. yeah. And then okay. like, you know, the other thing is you know, one of my clients, you know, that we got her brand down, we got her vibe and her message and all this kind of thing down. And then she found out that somebody else in her town is using the same verbal lingo and language that she is. And you're like, I, I think they're stealing it from me. I think, you know, they're, they're making this about them. And I said, maybe she's like, they're stealing my vibe. And I'm like, no, they can't steal your vibe. Your vibe is you. They can copy your language, but if you go into an event with them and you feel threatened by them because they're stealing your language, then you've just given them your power. You've got to own the fact of who you are and that you're untouchable because no one can copy you. They can be a second class version of you, but they can never be you. And as long as you are still vibrating who you are and you're not afraid of anybody else coming close to you, no one can take that from you. Exactly. And that's an energy that you are attracting the right kind of people. There's another person in my town that is also called a visibility coach. Um, I think she's like the visibility queen. Um, and people are like, oh my gosh, there's two of you in the same city. I'm like, first of all, we have 2 billion people in our city. 
Second, um, we don't we don't put out the same messages. And there's probably you more know? than just the two of you who are doing visibility coaching. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure there is. I'm sure <laughs> two there million is. people. Yeah, there's more than yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, we don't put out the same vibe. We don't put out the same messages. Mm-hmm. We don't have the same energy. And your vibe is what attracts people to you. Oh yeah. So two yeah. people can say the exact same words. Mm-hmm. And some people are going to hear those words come out of one person's mouth and go, wow, I really love her. And the same words come out of somebody else's mouth and go, God, I can't stand her. They mm-hmm. said the same thing. Yeah. Right? The other thing is they can have, they can, you can even have a competitor go to your website and copy all of your, your language word for word and put that it on their website. To us. You that happened to us. Somebody yeah. copied our, somebody actually copied verbatim our about us page. Yeah. Uh, my, my husband is a world-class custom furniture maker and someone took our about us page that included our personal story and put it on their about us page. Word for word. Word for word. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I've seen it. I've seen it happen before. And I've seen the people go like totally freak out. I'm like, here's the difference. If you are showing up on a regular basis in your social media, no one can touch you. Even if they if they steal your language, no one can touch you because they can't be you. Mm-hmm. They can steal your language. They can try to copy you. They can't keep up with you. Mm-hmm. So you have to have the reassurance that now if you're not showing up and you're trying to hide behind your service, then yeah, people are going to look at them and look at you and go, oh, and then they're going to price shop because then you're a commodity. Yeah. If you're trying to blend in and you're too afraid to stand out, you're like a where's Waldo, yeah. right? Listener, if you're in network marketing or direct sales, I hope you just heard what she said. You're not selling the commodity. You're selling yourself. Mm-hmm. So think about that. All right. We need to wrap up. So tell us your favorite marketing tool, tip or technique. Oh, um, well, I mean, video and I, and I will tell you as a photographer for years, I was intimidated and scared and of not showing up on video. I did not want to do it, but my gut and all my research had told me this is where it is. This is where I need to be. Um, and I, heard from somebody and it it got me out of my fear place um was that when you look in the mirror you see yourself in pieces and parts because you're used to looking at yourself every day but when someone else looks at you they see a whole person they don't see all your pieces and parts because they're not staring at all your pieces and parts as much as you stare at yourself on a regular basis so And then the other thing was that if you're not showing up because you're afraid of how you look and you don't really like the way you look, you're actually doing your clients a major disservice of not getting to know who you are before they come to you because they don't come to you for, if if you're not showing up on video, if you're not showing up in your social media, if you're not showing up in person and you're not letting people get to know who you are you are letting them judge you by the things that blend in and that are white noise to everybody else around you. But the more that you're willing to be yourself and show up on video, even if it's super messy in the beginning, the more you do it, the more confidence you're going to get. And the more confidence you have, the more often you're going to show up. And the more it's just, it's a, you know, it's a cycle. It, it works with, so I, I have been producing video content on YouTube for over 10 years, probably 15 years. And my very first video is still up there. I left it up there. It's really bad. It's grainy and green and, and gross. But I, I, you know, I put it, I put it up there and just left it out there. Most of the videos that have a lot of visibility are where I'm bald and talking about living with breast cancer. Mm-hmm. And I just go on there wigless and or wearing my head in a scarf. And I'm telling, talking about something that happened to me cancer related. And those, some, some of those videos have 30, 40, 50,000 views, right? The, the number one most viewed non-cancer related video on my YouTube channel is of me throwing an ax and completely missing the target and the ax <laughs> bouncing off the target. But the message there is 
failure is part of learning. Yeah. Failure is part yeah. of growth. Fail. If you don't fail, how do you know you're growing? Right. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, you know, I put the video out, I made it epic. I, it has absolutely amazing music in the background. You know, I, I put it out there because the message is just because you failed doesn't mean you shouldn't throw the ax. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But people like the mistakes. People like yeah. to see the bloopers. My blooper videos, when I put out a blooper from a podcast, like I might have a blooper video come out of this one if you can hear my cat puking in the background from earlier, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? so I, I put those blooper videos out and inevitably the blooper videos get better traction than the yeah. stuff, the really good content, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I have one for my reels that I've been gathering of all the things where, because I'll do the video in camera and then I'll splice and dice it in, in shot, you know, before I post it. And I have so many times when I'm talking to video and then I'll go, yeah, okay. Okay. We're not doing that. And then I end up cutting that out, but I still have all of them. Mm -hmm. So to go back and like splice them together to show like, none of my videos are as perfect the first time around as you think they are. This is what they look like behind the scenes is and I'm, I, I never put out perfect content ever. Yeah. Cause that's not my vibe. Yeah. This is my vibe. I show up in the sweatshirt that's falling off my shoulder. <laughs> <you know? laughs> that's my vibe. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. But the other thing about video is you never know who's watching you, mm -hmm. who's stalking you, mm -hmm. who loves your content, but will never like anything and they'll mm -hmm. never comment on anything, but you, you don't know that they're there. Until all of a sudden you get an email going, okay, Sarah, I'm ready. I'm, I need to work with you. How do we do this? And you're mm -hmm. like, where did you come from? Yeah. No, but they've been there the whole time. I run into people in the grocery store, uh, friends that I grew up with. And they're like, oh my gosh, you're blowing up. You're blowing up. You're all over the place. Your, your videos are amazing. They're not on my radar because they don't do anything with my mm -hmm. videos, but they are watching. Yeah. Well, you know? I, I, my, I've, I've told this story on the show before I hired my coach, my business coach, after I spent a year stalking her videos, mm -hmm. I stalked her videos for a year and then I hired her. Yeah. But I don't think, I, 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 I don't think that she knew that until I shared the video with her of, you know, the little short video that I extracted, you know, a little short, <laughs> I, I do, I do, I do a lot of video repurposing. So I extract a little short yeah. where I told the story about that. And then I said, Hey, I didn't know if you knew this or not, but this story is about you. <laughs> and she's like, Oh my God, that's me. <laughs> so, yeah, there are people yeah. who are watching. This has been a fabulous conversation. Thank you so much again for Absolutely. last minute coming on the show to talk about visibility. So, this is your moment of gratitude for whom or what are you most grateful? Oh my goodness. I am so grateful for so many of my friends in my life that have just always been there with me through all the ups and downs. Um, but I'm also really grateful for all my failures. I'm really, really grateful. And even in the moment when they're so painful and I'm going through them and I just can't see my way out in hindsight, every single one of them have made me so much stronger and more durable. And, and I always have lessons that I'm still learning. I always have things that I'm like, okay, okay, universe, I hear you. I see you. We're doing this again because obviously I didn't learn this the first time. And, but they're lessons that just make me a better person, a more compassionate person, a person that just believes in myself. And I, and I find more strength that I didn't know was there, that then I can turn around and share with people when I see that they're struggling. I'm like, I see you. I hear you. I've been there. Let me help you through this too. Um, yeah, they're not fun at all, but they are some of the biggest blessings that have happened as painful as they were. Thanks for tuning in to Gratitude Geek, where we help DIY marketers attract raving fans and repeat buyers. Don't forget to check out the show notes at gratitudegeek.com for links to all the resources mentioned in this episode. If you enjoyed it, please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. Our theme music is by Rev Brock and Soul Lily. I'm Candice Rodardi reminding you that gratitude is like manure. It's just a pile of poo until you spread it around. Stay groovy, my friends. Stay groovy.